Good morning, everyone. This hearing will come to order. This hearing titled, Understanding Odebrecht, Lesson for Combating Corruption in the Americas, will focus on Odebrecht's regional corruption scandal and U.S. policy options to support the fight against corruption in Latin America. Without objection, all members may have five days to submit statements, question, extraneous materials for the record, subject to the length, of, length limitation in the rules. I will now make an opening statement before turning to the ranking member for his opening statement. Somebody close the door, please. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today for a topic that extends across much of our hemisphere. Odebrecht is a Brazilian construction firm, but its name has become synonymous with one of the largest global corruption scandals in history. This web of bribery and money laundering with Odebrecht is at its, at its center has reached at least 10 countries in the Western Hemisphere, brought down precedents and shaken public confidence in government institutions. In 2016, Odebrecht and Braxcom, a petrochemical company partly owned by Odebrecht, reached a plea deal with the U.S. Department of Justice. Under that agreement, Odebrecht agreed to pay at least $3.5 billion in penalties to resolve bribery charges in the U.S., Brazil, and Switzerland. It was the largest ever global bribery resolution in history. We know from the agreement that Odebrecht paid nearly $800 million in bribes from 2001 to 2016. However, this may be a low estimate. Countries like Venezuela have stifled efforts to investigate allegations linking government officials to corrupt payoffs. The scandal has rocked the political system of numerous countries, including Brazil and Peru. Just last week, Brazil's former president, Michel Temer, was arrested for accepting bribes and campaign contributions from Odebrecht and other firms. In Peru, virtually every major political leader has been tarnished by Odebrecht, including the last four presidents. In this hearing, we hope to better understand how this massive corruption scheme was executed. We will examine how Odebrecht attempted to buy off politicians from across the political spectrum. We will also look at how he moved money across borders using anonymous shell companies. A harsh reality is that dirty money from Odebrecht passed frequently through U.S. banking and financial systems. We must examine how we can do a better job in the future of stemming these illicit flows. We should also take this opportunity to assess U.S. policy and U.S. assistance programs to combat corruption in Latin America. Many governments and civil society organizations in the region are working hard to learn from cases like Odebrecht and prevent this from happening again. I believe the U.S. must be a reliable partner for those government officials seeking to root out corruption for the local organizations seeking, and for the local organizations seeking to expose it. We should identify and support those who show the courage and political will to tackle this problem whenever, wherever it appears. As we look to the fiscal year 2020 budget, it is essential that we provide levels of foreign assistance funding that reflect our commitment to supporting regional fight against corruption. We know that corruption erodes democracy, undermines the rule of law, and, br and breeds citizen distrust. And it is imperative that we work together to strengthen the region's institutions. Democracy, human rights, and the rule of law should be at the center of our foreign policy. I look forward to hearing from, experts, from the experts with us today about further steps the U.S. government can take to help combat corruption in this hemisphere. Thank you, and I now turn to the ranking member for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
The Odebrecht bribery scandal is unprecedented in our hemisphere. It uncovered a systemic level of corruption that has reached every corner of Latin America and has led to the arrests and investigations of hundreds of public officials and businessmen in a, nearly a dozen countries. The scandal highlights the region's ongoing struggle to combat corruption, but it also presents an opportunity for the United States and our regional partners to discuss meaningful public-private sector reforms and to improve anti-corruption mechanisms and strengthen democratic institutions. The Odebrecht scandal was discovered through the investigation known as Operation Lava Jato, or Car Wash, which was initially launched by Brazilian authorities in March of 2014 to uncover corruption within Brazil's state-controlled Petrobras oil company. Odebrecht, a Brazilian construction company, was also discovered to be providing bribes for preferential treatment in awarded contracts. However, Odebrecht's corruption knew no boundaries and extended far beyond Brazil, from Argentina to Mexico, and as far away as Angola and Africa. Lamentably, I have personal experience with witnessing their activities in Panama. Many jobs that me and my partners were going to pursue, like Tucuman Airport, we dropped off as soon as Odebrecht joined the bid list. To date, we know that nearly $800 million in Odebrecht fines have been accepted by government officials and candidates in 10 Latin American nations. Through its in-house Division of Structured Operations, it's quite a euphemism, Odebrecht used bribes to secure construction contracts worth over $3 billion. High-level officials have been linked to Odebrecht scandals in Colombia, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic, including pan links to former presidents and vice presidents in Brazil, Peru, Argentina, Ecuador, and of course, Mr. Martinelli in Panama. While no country or region of the globe is completely immune to corruption, the Odebrecht scandal highlights the pervasive corruption throughout Latin America, which holds the region's civil society, governments, and economies hostage. Corruption within the government and public sector of Latin America impedes regional growth, creates artificial economic barriers, and erodes public confidence in democratic institutions. Further, this corruption and its ruinous consequences are a main driver of regional migration and the narcotics trafficking which directly affects us here in the United States. While, America, while, while Latin America faces many challenges in rooting out corruption, many countries in the region have provided a framework for solutions in trying to solve their regional corruption issues. In Brazil, Transparency International, in consultation with public and private partners, has developed a package of reforms to include constitutional amendments, government institution reforms, and new rules related to corruption. Brazil's Minister of Justice has so far incorporated a number of these reforms into draft laws. Similarly, Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru have all considered anti-corruption measures in 2018. I know that INCAI in Nicaragua and, and Costa Rica are working on things in connection with many of my associates in Panama to strengthen institutions there, which suffered great debility during the Odebrecht-Martinelli corruption times. The United States is also providing assistance to strengthen the institutional and technical capabilities of our regional partners to corrupt, combat corruption. The State Department is working with the Department of Justice to implement programs such as the Criminal Investigative Training Assistance Program and the Office of Overseas Prosecutorial Assistance and Training. I encourage our executive agencies to continue to work together and with our partners in Latin America to offer training and assistance to better practices in good governance and rule of law. I further encourage the exchange and posting of American officials throughout the region to assist in anti-corruption and to serve as a resource for the region's governments, private sector, and financial institutions. Civil society also plays a critical role in demanding transparency and accountability in government, and I encourage continued support for strengthening civil society's role in fighting against corruption. I commend our friends in the region who are taking meaningful steps in rooting out corruption and upholding the rule of law. I'm especially encouraged by Brazil's response to the Odebrecht scandal and by the activities that, that Panama is taking to try to address the, the time following the Odebrecht era there. And I support continued efforts to build off of these lessons throughout the region. I look forward to the testimonies and opinions of all these important witnesses today, and I want to thank Mr. Chairman Ceres for holding this hearing. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Congressman Rooney. 
Let me introduce first <clears throat> Michael Cal Camilleri. Am I saying that correctly? Director of the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program at the Inter-American Dialogue. He served from 2012 to 2017 as the Western Hemisphere Advisor on the Secretary of State's Policy Planning Staff and as Director for Indian Affairs at the National Security Council. Welcome to our hearing. We will then hear from Ms. Katia Salazar, Executive Director at the Due Process of Law Foundation, where she has worked since 2004. Under her leadership, the foundation created the Human Rights and Extractive Industries Program. And the organization became involved in the defense of the inner Inter-American System for Human Rights. Thank you. Finally, we will hear from Mr. David L. Hall, who is now partnered at Wiggins and Dana after more than two decades as a federal prosecutor with the U.S. Department of Justice at Wiggins and Dana. He advises clients concerning the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, the False Claims Act, and the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy, including assessment of policies and procedures as well as data breach preparation and responses. I ask the witnesses, please limit your testimony to five minutes, and without objection, your prepared written statement would be made part of the record. Thank you so much for being here today. Mr. Camilleri, you have five minutes. Would you turn your mic on? Is that better? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Rooney, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored to be here. Uh, corruption represents an enormous obstacle to economic development and human rights. Across the globe and closer to home, it weakens democracies, facilitates drug trafficking and organized crime, breeds extremism and unrest, and prompts mass migration. It also creates an unlevel playing field for U.S. businesses, as the ranking member referenced. For these reasons, I believe that combating corruption advances the U.S. national interest in a more free, secure, just, and peaceful hemisphere and world. And I commend the subcommittee for co convening today's hearing. Latin America today is, with a few notable exceptions, characterized by functional democracies. However, consolidating the rule of law is a continuing challenge, and corruption remains pervasive. The Odebrecht case offers a singular opportunity to understand how corruption works in Latin America, why it happens, which countries are best equipped to combat it, and what the United States government can do to help. My written submission to the subcommittee addresses all four of these issues in some detail. I will focus here on the role of the U.S. government. First, the basics. Odebrecht admitted to the Department of Justice that it paid $788 million in bribes in 10 Latin American and two African countries. Odebrecht's bribery was not just widespread, it was systematic. The company's secret division of structured operations was set up specifically for this purpose. The bribes in question were often destined for political campaigns. From Brazil to Mexico, Venezuela to Panama, the Odebrecht schemes had a dual impact on citizens. Not only pilfering public funds for private use, but also distorting electoral processes through illicit campaign financing. The Odebrecht case reveals a series of structural weaknesses that allow corruption to flourish in Latin America. These include a permissive environment characterized by lack of accountability and specific challenges related to public contracting, campaign finance, and the role of shell companies in offshore accounts. The contrasting responses to the Odebrecht case are also revealing. In some countries, presidents, ministers, and CEOs went to jail. In others, investigations stalled. The judicial systems that enjoyed the greatest success were characterized by prosecutorial, prosecutorial independence and political will, as well as technical capacity, effective use of tools such as plea bargaining, and a strong supportive role for civil society and the independent media. So what can the United States do to support Latin America's anti-corruption fight? I will offer four recommendations based on lessons learned from the Odebrecht case. First, strengthen the Department of Justice's mandate and capacity to combat foreign corruption. The Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is one of the most underappreciated sources of U.S. soft power in Latin America. Of course, the FCPA is designed to keep corporations with ties to the U.S. out of the business of corruption. 
It does not aim to police the conduct of foreign officials. But when a citizen of Mexico or Argentina or Ecuador learns from a DOJ plea, plea agreement that Odebrecht paid tens of millions of dollars in bribes to dirty politicians in her country, she wants to know who was on the receiving end of those bribes. I believe it should be the policy of the United States to help her find out. Second, support proven in-country accountability mechanisms. This can be as simple as a well-timed tweet or an appearance by the U.S. Ambassador at a high-profile trial. It includes maintaining U.S. backing for international cooperation mechanisms that have proven highly effective in supporting countries with fragile judicial systems, most notably CICIG in Guatemala. And U.S. foreign assistance programs should prioritize support for independent journalism and civil society watchdog groups. Third, maximize the impact of the Global Magnitsky Act. Staffing up the Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control will help ensure that OFAC has the bandwidth to investigate and target both corrupt foreign officials and the networks surrounding them. And finally, lead by example. The U.S. leads best in our hemisphere when we lead by example. Unfortunately, in the past year, the United States dropped out of the top 20 countries on Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index. One specific way in which the United States can do more here at home is by improving beneficial ownership transparency so that shell companies cannot be used to launder dirty money through the U.S. financial system. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this crucial issue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Ms. Salazar. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, and, uh, and thank you again, Chairman Cires, Ranking Member Rooney, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify this morning. As it was mentioned, the Odebrecht case represents maybe the largest transnational bribery scheme ever uncovered in Latin America. The case was a difficult blow for Latin American democracies and a challenge for its judicial institutions, which were not well prepared to investigate and prosecute cases of this magnitude. But it was also important because it allowed us to understand how sophisticated criminal organizations operate in the 21st century. Latin America has a robust international and, and, and national legal frameworks to combat corruption. So how could, do, how could the Odebrecht scheme operate successfully for so many years? I will now present some lessons learned and recommendations arising out of this case. First, a strong legal framework alone is insufficient. State institutions must be able, in practice, to address the challenges presented by grand corruption, which means adapting institutional designs, policies, and methodologies to new realities, the realities of the criminal organizations in the 21st century. Second, judges and prosecutors in charge of these cases must be able to carry out their work with autonomy and free from undue interference either external or internal from within their own institutions. This, and this is still one of the most common problems in Latin America, especially for highly sensitive cases. Third, the modus operandi that has been brought to light by the Odebrecht case shows that large corruption networks seek to control criminal investigations against them and thereby guarantee impunity for their illicit actions through the control of high-level justice sector authorities, especially attorneys general and the high courts. To this end, and this is very important, such networks exert their influence on the appointment mechanism of these officials, which is much easier to do when the designations are in the hands of the political powers and have little transparency and citizen participation as counterbalance. In this context, I would like to emphasize the role of the Attorney General as a figure of fundamental importance in the fight against corruption in Latin America. It is the, the Attorney General, it is an official with significant power, but also one extremely vulnerable on the face of the influ influ influence of people and groups interested in shielding themselves from prosecution. In Latin America, most prosecutors 
are independent from the executive branch. But aside from, at least in theory, but aside from a few exceptions, the President and the Congress still have the almost exclusive power to appoint and remove the Attorney General. Again, with few safeguards to counterbalance this power, these decisions could be, and in many cases are, arbitrary and motivated by reasons other than strengthening the rule of law. The aforementioned doesn't discount the need for international support mechanisms to tackle grand corruption as occurred in Guatemala and Honduras with Sisig and Masi, where there have been successes but where the resilience of corrupt networks and their capacity to respond aggressively when their interests are at risk has also been put on display. Although there are many more lessons to be learned from this case, I have focused my comments on the role on the judicial systems because, in my opinion, the best deterrent to the commission of corruption crimes is the successful prosecution of high-profile cases involving high-ranking authorities. A few broad ideas about what the U.S. can do to support the fight against corruption in Latin America. First, through its foreign assistant, assistance, the U.S. government should prioritize programs that support judicial independence, especially those oriented towards improving selection processes of high-level judicial, judicial authorities. U.S. diplomacy should also play a role in monitoring and making public statements on these issues when needed, like it has done in Guatemala and in El Salvador. Furthermore, the U.S. should continue supporting investigative journalism in Latin America, as well as civil society organizations throughout the region, leading the investigation of corruption cases, monitoring selection processes of high-level judicial, judicial authorities, and promoting institutional reforms. Finally, the U.S. must pay attention to the role of campaign financing and support strategic reforms in Latin America. True campaign finance reform is needed in the region to avoid repeating the history of Odebrecht. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Hall, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Sirius, Ranking Member Rooney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear today. On December 21st, 2016, Odebrecht and its petrochemical unit, Brascom, each entered a guilty plea to one count of conspiracy to violate the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. The U.S. government estimated that Odebrecht conspired to pay approximately $788 million in bribes in association with more than 100 construction projects in 12 countries, mostly in Latin America. The global investigation of this scheme has ensnared almost a third of Brazil's government ministers, two former presidents of Brazil, two former presidents of Peru, a vice president of Ecuador, and many, many others. This conspiracy is nothing short of astonishing in scale. If somebody wrote a movie about it, I wouldn't believe it. And it's not a one-off event, and it did not result from the actions of a few rogue employees or officials. It could hardly have been more systematic and sustained. The company, Odebrecht, actually created a bribery department, <clears throat> which was known as the Division of Structured Operations for the specific purpose of operating the corrupt scheme and laundering money. The scheme came to light in 2014 after allegations of money laundering uh, revealed that money dealers operating out of gas stations and car washes were working on behalf of an executive at Petrobras, the Brazilian Petroleum Corporation. Brazilian law enforcement uh, initiated Operation Car Wash and discovered that Petrobras directors had been overpaying on contracts in order to fund uh, kickbacks that were then deposited into a secret slush fund. This slush fund was used, in turn, to bribe politicians. Significantly, and unlike many FCPA cases prosecuted in the United States, this case originated from an investigation that began outside the United States by non-U.S. authorities. In the past, the U.S. often stood alone in its anti-corruption efforts, and as a result, uh, other nations did not uh, enforce similarly robust anti-corruption laws. Some believed that the FCPA placed U.S. companies at a disadvantage in global commerce compared to international competitors that were not uh, con similarly constrained in behavior and did not operate under the burden, a financial burden of FCPA compliance and record-keeping requirements. All this might be changing, 
The Odebrecht case Im itself implies as much, given the extensive and effective anti-corruption effort displayed by a magnitude of foreign nations. If these trends continue, it's good news for U.S. business operating on a global playing field because that playing field might become more level. There's much that the United States can do to take advantage of this momentum. Uh, for one thing, it can continue enforcing FCPA against foreign corporations as well as domestic ones. But the degree of difficulty faced by U.S. enforcement and regulators in investigating uh, conspiracies on foreign soil is very high. This is why it's so important that foreign governments are increasing their efforts in anti-corruption enforcement. The United States can directly assist foreign authorities in anti-corruption investigations and enforcement, and the best way to do this is to have U.S. investigators and prosecutors on the ground in foreign countries developing relationships with their foreign counterparts. This sort of integration can be accomplished by expanding the scope of attache programs, such as those of the Justice Department, the FBI, and the Department of Homeland Security, as well as expanding the scope of other programs, including State Department programs that have already been mentioned. The United States has long been at the forefront of prosecuting anti-corruption cases and is now presented with a new opportunity to partner effectively with foreign governments in enforcing anti-corruption laws. Thus, the Odebrecht case might, with a little luck, portend the beginning of more effective and more fair global anti-corruption law enforcement. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Before the, we question, I'd like to recognize the former chairman of the Western Hemisphere, County Marcus, in the audience today. We worked very well together when he was chairman from Florida. My, uh, <clears throat> you know, this is a, a topic of interest to me for many years, uh, the corruption in the Western Hemisphere. I really think that some of these countries have been set back for so many years because of the constant corruption that you read about it. So when I came to Congress, and you try to encourage attention to the Western Hemisphere, and you try to encourage people to have money to help some of these countries because they really do need it. The question of corruption always surfaces. Why should we give money to countries that is so corrupt that the money that we give them may not go to the initial uh, plan that we originally wanted to? And, you know, it's a tough question to ask when you try to increase funding for these countries. And then we have this huge corruption case with Odebrecht. Uh, Mr. Camilleri, I I'm interested in how these, uh, these, these bribes made it through the banking of the United States and how, how was it that they were able to do this and it took us so long to pick up on this? Can you answer that? Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for your longstanding interest and concern for, for this issue and for convening the hearing. Um, there were, um, within the Odebrecht conspiracy, acts that took place on U.S. soil those included meetings of Odebrecht executives. It included um, money that found its way uh, into our financial system. Um, Odebrecht, however, was, was um, pretty systematic about how it uh, used this division of struct op structured operations to have the bribes paid um, and did things, for example, like acquiring a bank uh, on a small Caribbean island, um, which it used in order to deposit uh, many of these payments into the uh, into the bank accounts um, affiliated with with the corrupt politicians they were looking to pay off. So um, while some of the money did find its way into the U.S., much of it was was routed uh, elsewhere. Um, the issue that I mentioned in my testimony is an important one. Um, beneficial ownership transparency um, is critical um, to allowing the law enforcement to scrutinize these financial flows, and it will, I think, just as importantly, put the United States in a much stronger position to then go to other countries where this sort of thing is happening and ask them to take the same steps um, that keep shell companies, in order to keep shell companies from being used um, as a route for illicit financial movements. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, I'm concerned that 
this administration, previous administrations, really did not speak up strongly enough on some of these uh, issues in some of these countries. For example, Ms. Salazar, can you speak to the fact that CSIG was kind of pushed out out of Guatemala and what that, what are the repercussions of that? Well, thank you. This is a very important question, uh, Mr. Sirius, because CSIG was a very important institution, not just for Guatemala, but for the whole region, for two main reasons, I think. First of all, because, of course, to, it helped Guatemala to uncover these like criminal organizations, networks, and how they operated. But they also show the region that it is possible to do something, to fight against corruption, to, to, to prosecute the corrupt. So, I mean, from the perspective of, of a Latin American expert on judicial reform, I have to say that I feel very, I felt very disappointed for the decision of the U.S. government to, you know, not giving an unconditional support to, to CICIG. Uh, it was really sad. Uh, as you know, the head of the CICIG is living in New York right now, and the CICIG will finish its mandate at, at the end of the year. Uh, and we expect that I mean, in general, the U.S. government can reflect about the lessons learned of the CSIC because there are other similar, institu similar initiatives going, I mean, moving around the region. In, in Ecuador, the president of Ecuador, for example, ha has offered to create a similar institution. In El Salvador, the, the new president has offered to create also a kind of CSIC. So I think it is important to take seriously the lessons learned from the CSIC and supported it. In general, international cooperation to combat corruption is a good idea. The bad idea is like thinking that there is a one size fits all method, so, because we need to analyze what are the particularities of each country. But I think, I think, with all respect, I think that the US government should support these kind of initiatives which bring international support to our countries. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member, Congressman Rooney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I've been doing business around the world since 1975 in my family companies. And when the FCPA came in, we didn't think much of it. It added a lot of complexity to our work in many parts of the world. But I've got to tell you, reading this stuff and hearing this testimony and watching the Odebrecht thing uh, impact in Latin America, makes me really appreciate one of the subsidiary roles of the SPCA was to attack the culture of corruption, not just specific instances, and, but the culture of corruption. And I just wonder, uh, Mr. Hall and Mr. Camilleri, you know, Brazil's known for the Zito and the culture of corruption, and how does that kind of culture contribute to what Odebrecht did and some of their competitors, who I'm not going to mention right now, and uh, how would that culture impede the Brazilian government's efforts to improve things now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rooney. I, I, I think it's clear that a culture of corruption is what leads to the criminal behavior. Um, and in, in, uh, in the case of Brazil, I, I would say that the Odebrecht case, what we've learned about that one conspiracy, the part that's public so far, um, demonstrates that that does exist. Um, I, I think that one of the, that, and I say this as sort of a law enforcement traditionalist, is that one of the positive effects from law enforcement actions like this, um, and, and particularly effective m multilateral law enforcement actions like this, is to create a deterrent effect and to change the standard. The problem with the culture of corruption is that it corrodes standards, and it lowers them, and it makes them, it, makes it seem okay to do things that people individually might understand is not the right thing to do, but it's the easy thing to do and I'm probably gonna get away with it. When law enforcement is effective in holding people to a higher standard, or holding companies and institutions and government agencies and government officers to a higher um, standard, it, 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 it creates a deterrent, but it also creates an incentive to hit that higher standard. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Mr. Camilleri. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, the Odebrecht case could only have happened in a culture of pervasive corruption. 
you only set up a dedicated bribe unit and pay hundreds of millions of dollars of bribes if you're pretty sure you can get away with it. Um, this was not something that was exceptional, that was a case of a few bad apples in the company. It was something that was premeditated, structured, systematic. Um, so I think your question goes to, to the heart uh, of what the, uh, what the case was revealed. Um, in terms of how it might be changing, I, I think, um, and very much consistent with what Mr. Hall said, um, first of all, incentives are changing. Um, just the very fact that this case exists and the fact that prosecutors in many countries, not all in Latin America, have sort of taken up what the DOJ did and pursued the cases at the local level creates a different set of incentives, so that's positive. Um, we have heard anecdotally that, that business culture may be changing in some places, that the, the sting of the Odebrecht case is being felt and that the business community is pushing back against uh, being shaken down for, for bribes. I think we'll have to see on that, but it's positive that those noises are, uh, are being heard. Um, and then the other piece of this, obviously, is, is political ref policy reform. That is the, the preventive, um, strengthening the, the frameworks and the enforcement mechanisms, and, and Katya spoke to this. I, I think there it's going to be more challenging, frankly. Um, in Brazil, the current justice minister uh, is former Judge Moro. He was the, the kind of the hero of the the Odebrecht case, the Lava Jato case at the local level, um, he's already had to water down the set of anti-corruption reforms that he presented to Congress um, because it's, it's very hard, it turns out, to get the, the folks who are um, part of the system to then reform that system. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there's some positive news, but also some wait and see, and, and a lot we need to do to kind of stay on this, uh, stay on this issue. Thank you. To, to follow, do I have one more, check, one more little bit? Uh, to, to follow up on uh, what Mr. Hall and, and you said as well, uh, Mr. Hall, about that you mentioned DOS and DOJ programs. How would you assess the level of cooperation across the different programs in the U.S. government and what things have been most effective? Well, I, of course, I can only speak from my experience, um, and I, I should point out that I did retire from the government five years ago, so maybe it's a little dated. Um, but in, I, I did serve for 23 years. I had a lot of experience with international investigations. Um, and it, generally speaking, I, I would describe the programs as um, really a, as, as nascent. Um, there, there are programs in place. I've seen them work very effectively in terms of training, in terms of advice. Um, what I think we can do better is to actually integrate our you know, operations with foreign law enforcement in a more sustained way than we do right now. Right now, uh, based on my experience, it's very ad hoc. So my experience would be I would have a, an investigation into a transnational crime, and I would you know, basically establish a bilateral relationship with, with a counterpart in a foreign country, and we would try to work together using you know, our different sets of laws and try to merge them so that we could you know, work effectively together, but it really was very ad hoc, and essentially I was talking to a stranger. I was trying to make friends, but we didn't really know each other. What, what would be better would be to have more attachés on the ground, because the job of an attaché is to establish those kinds of relationships, so that when a field prosecutor like me shows up and says, here's what I want to do, the attaché um, knows who to call. And I've seen that work well where there are attaches and particularly where there are good ones who really do have those kinds of relationships and really can make that work. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Congressman Espayat. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, ranking member. So Brazil, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, Panama, Angola, and Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, Guatemala, Colombia, Mexico, Mozambique, and several other countries that allegedly have been involved in this major scandal. Uh, my first question is, um, are there any, uh, Mr. Hall, this is to you, are there any current uh, prosecutions, uh, open prosecutions in the U.S. federal system of cases directly connected to, to the Odebrecht case? Since I'm no longer with the government, I, I don't actually know the answer to that authoritatively. My understanding is the answer to that is yes, is that the investigation is continuing. I'm confident, well, we've just seen just with, you know, recent events in Brazil that um, the investigation certainly is continuing overseas, and my understanding is 
than it is here too. So here in the U.S. circuits of federal courts, uh, there are open investigations. I'm, yes, I'm not not anything that's charged, but my understanding is that that the investigation does continue. Okay. My second question is: uh, We've seen what's happened with CSIC and Masic and Ms. Salazar. Uh, there seems to be a resistance in Latin America because of the history of Latin America of outside groups coming in to tell locals what to do. Uh, I happen to think that in some of those countries there are many good people in the civil society that want to battle and combat uh, corruption, uh, and nonpartisan people, people of goodwill, uh, good government folks that want to really uh, combat uh, corruption. Do you have like a model, uh, is there a model that functions uh, sort of like outside of the CC uh, massive uh, structure that involves local people that could be impartial and, and, and really have ownership and skin in the game to uh, combat a corruption like the Odebrecht corruption mm -hmm. in these countries? Yes, uh, Mr. Spayat, um, Actually, there are different models that can be used to support a particular country uh, using international law and international mechanisms. CSIC and MASI are just one model, but, the, but there are many others promoted for, by UN, by, by, the, by the organizations of American states, which include a different level of international personnel and international law or international mechanisms involvement. For example, I'll but give what about locally? Because I think that yeah. people see uh, international entities or or folks from outside the country as interventionists in some way. But I feel that in those countries there are good people that want to battle corruption. Is there a model that will bring in uh, good folks that will well, combat? It, I'm sorry. I, actually, in Sisi and Masi, there are many local peoples. Not all of them are foreigners. So, I mean, I don't think, I mean, the, 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 the leaders, the, right. the heads the leadership, of the, right. the institution, the leadership maybe are people from other countries, but there are many locals in the, in the institutions. But uh, what I wanted to say is, again, there are different models. There is not just one model that we, that we need to apply. For example, uh, and this is connected with what Mr. Hall say, uh, there are countries where you know, their general prosecutor's offices have been open to receive international cooperation, international legal assistance, people from abroad, but work. Yeah, but usually local. those local prosecutor's offices are appointed by the local government, and they may themselves be involved in corruption. But what about having an entity, an impartial, nonpartisan entity in a country? Do you have anything? Is there anything that works out there? For me, CC has worked. Okay. Uh, for me, for example, the International Commission of Human Rights, belonging to the Organization of American States, has a, an initiative called Grupo de Expertos, group of experts, and they have created this group of experts to send to Nicaragua and to Mexico okay. to analyze the case of the 43 stu students disappeared. This one, a, this was a kind, these initiatives were a kind of combination, and they Thank work you. also. I have one last question for Mr. Hall. You mentioned there was a bribery department, right? So like structure for this. Where was this department and who headed it? It, it was a department of Odebrecht and it was li literally created for the purpose of organizing in a corporate way the payment of... Well, where was it based? Yeah. I, I believe in Brazil. And who headed it? I don't know the answer to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congress from Florida, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. And um, it, it, to me, it's fascinating to see the level of corruption around the world. Um, and I think a universal truth is all governments are made up of people of some one way or another. And whenever people are involved, there's always a level of corruption involved. And we can look at our own government and our own country. Uh, so we're not excluded from that. And it's just the, the sad thing to me is that it robs the individuals in those countries of the resources of that nation, whether it's Maduro in Venezuela or in this case in Brazil. And I look over the years, the level of corruption that goes on, um, and I read an article yesterday in the Wall Street Journal um, 
It says, since Brazil's return to democracy in 1985 after a military dictatorship, four of the eight presidents who took office have now fallen afoul of the country's law, either impeached for misconduct or arrested after leaving office. Mr. Temer's arrest is further evidence of a crisis in Brazilian democracy, according to uh, Marcelo Frezo, a member of Congress for the left-wing socialism liberal party, Liberty Party. We, this is what I find interesting, and I want to ask you if this is just the way business is. We can't celebrate the arrest of another former president, he said. Corruption is structural and is embedded in the relationships between our institution. And I ask you, is this truly the norm for Latin America, Asia, Africa, or even the U.S.? Um, Mr. Cam Cam Camilar Cam Camilleri, <laughs> excuse me. Fourth time lucky. Thank you, Congressman. Um, corruption certainly was structural uh, in Brazil. I think that's what the, this case, among others, uh, revealed. Um, I think that has to do um, with with different issues. Some some having to do with accountability and incentives, and some having to do with the particular um, kind of coalition presidential system um, that the that the Brazilians have, where essentially um, presidents are very weak and have to cobble together uh, legislative majorities among a dozen or more parties, and at first pork and later corruption became the currency with which they were able to govern. And so there are some, some structural things there and that are particular to Brazil that will make it difficult um, uh, for them to root out uh, this problem. And I think that's what the article you're referencing uh, it is, and I mean, we can at. look at JBS. I got pulled into this too, the largest meat producers in the world. Uh, they got slapped with a $3.2 billion fine for paying hundreds of millions of dollars out in bribes. In your statement, you said the World Bank calls corruption public en enemy number one for the developing world. The United Nations observes that corruption represents an enormous obstacle to the realization of human rights, and that unchecked, it can undermine the functioning and legitimacy of institutions the rule of law, and ultimately the state itself. And I, I see it as a cancer that just erodes society, it robs people of the wealth of a country that should be propelling society. So my question for the panel is number one, can you point out any examples where U.S. support has led to progress in addressing anti-corruption in the region? And we'll focus on Latin America. Mrs. Salazar, or Ms. Salazar. Okay, um, okay. A ver, um, two things. I want to I, I want I want to start saying two things. First of all, uh, when I when we or at least when I talk about inst corrupt institutions in Latin America, I mean in general it is true, but in particular we need to see each country and each each particularities. Uh, thans, I mean sure. I do believe that there are countries where, in spite the whole institution could be, you know, co not co-opted but by, but attacked by corruption, there are like good people, good sure. champions, good, I mean, good people working to fight for corruption, eh, against corruption. So I think we need to support, or you need to support these groups. And this is something that we have seen, for example- Let me ask you this, how do you support those? Are you familiar with MCC, the Millennial Challenge Corporation? Yeah, yes. You know, they go in and they have a set of metrics that they measure a country. Yeah. I propose that we do trade that way. We trade with countries. We set up a, a metric. Uh -huh. Countries at the very top that fall in alignment with America, not us dictating to them, but if they fall up here, they get the best trade deals. Countries that are below get a little bit less trade deal. They can always aspire to get to the other level, and that's the only way I can see that we can do that. But in doing that, we have to make sure we're following the rules the way we're supposed to. Uh, I'd love to go on, but I'm out of time. Thank you for being here. Congressman Vargas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing and also the ranking member. Thank you, especially thanks to the people that are here with us today, especially the presenters. Um, Mr. Camilleri, you said that it's hard to get people that are part of the system to reform that system. As you know, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador AMLO in Mexico was recently elected president. Uh, 
he ran on an anti-corruption platform that was going to be and is what he's attempting to do. And a number of us were able to go down to his inauguration and he basically said, you know, if we can stop corruption in this country, we can do all sorts of things for the country and quite aggressively proposed the future for, um, for Mexico. What do you think of Mexico and what's going on there with the programs that he's instituted or he's attempting to institute, and how do you think that's going to work out? Because he was not part, I'd say he was not part of the, the people he was trying to get in, obviously, but he wasn't part of that system. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I think you're right about that. AMLO is, is somebody who is viewed by the Mexican people as having a level of personal rectitude that is pretty unique in that political system. That gives him um, a real platform um, to take on this issue. And I think it's right to say that the backlash against uh, corruption was one of the things that, that most drove his, uh, his successful uh, election campaign. I, I think what's been perhaps concerning is that um, it's not clear what the, what the institutional kind of approach to combating corruption will be from his government. That is, having this momentum, having this platform, having the, um, the personal legitimacy that he brings to the issue, um, what is he going to do with that? Um, this is not gonna be a case where the, the fact that the president is not a crook um, is enough to make you know, every last cop in Mexico honest, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna have to do some things at a structural level, starting with, for example, um, and DPLF has done a lot of work on this, um, bringing greater independence to the public prosecutor's office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, th those well, he sorts has of proposed things a number of these measures, I think, that you probably have seen him in his inauguration. I don't know if he's going to follow through, but he certainly did propose them. Yeah, I think we're waiting to see. I mean, we, I've met with his, his minister who was sort of running this file. I, I mm -hmm. think they, they, their diagnosis of the situation is accurate. I think they are... They are well-meaning, um, but they've been a little bit slow out of the gate, to be honest, in terms of actually putting in place a, a program to, to weed out corruption in the country. It's okay. early, but um, we'll have to wait and see. Before my time runs out, I have to do ask, ask this, and I would be remiss if I didn't. I'm a former Jesuit. I was in the Jesuits for about five years. And Nicaragua right now has an incredible problem with the president there and some of the corruption. And in particular, I fear for the life of Chepe, Idiakwis. He is the rector of the Jesuit University of UCA because he's standing up to the corruption. Um, can anyone comment about what's going on in Nicaragua? And again, in particular, this priest who I think has been very brave to stand up to the corruption that he sees. Mr. Hall, would you like to handle that one if you can and we'll go to Ms. Salazar if you, if you have information on it? Go ahead. I don't think I'm the right person to answer this. Okay, Ms. Salazar. Yes, uh, well, the situation in Nicaragua is very complicated, and somehow, you know, from my opinion, from my point of view, what we have seen last year in Nicaragua, I mean, the, the, the citizen movements and the people killed, detained, political detentions, and so on and so forth, are the result of a process, of a process of 20 years of a co-optation of the uh, uh, government institutions. So, from my perspective, from the work I do, I feel somehow also guilty for not been able to say something before, because now all institutions are co-opted by the political power. And it's gonna be, it's gonna take a time uh, to find, I mean, to enter into a transition, a transition process. I think this is what this country needs, a transition process when we have through accountability and also institutional reforms. Well, thank you. And, and again, I, I wanna mention again, the priest's name is uh, Father Chepe. Idiakwis, uh, he's been threatened many times. Uh, the university has been harassed, has been attacked. I want to make sure that we keep uh, him and the university in our mind when we speak about this issue. Um, I, I hope he was not uh, one of the people that's been killed because a number of people have been killed. And so again, I would uh, mention his name, Chepe Idiakwis, uh, Society of Jesus, uh, the rector of the UCA. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Congressman Levin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Camilleri, when it comes to the U.S. role in fighting corruption, both our actions and our words matter. Yet at times, the Trump administration has been inconsistent in speaking out about corruption in the Americas. 
The administration has been relatively quiet about the efforts by Guatemalan President Jimmy Morales to undermine the U.S. supported, U.N. supported International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, or CSIG, particularly while it investigates corruption within Mr. Morales' own administration. Last month, foreign policy reported, quote, that over the past two years, the Trump administration's political appointees have worked to undermine a highly regarded UN anti-corruption commission in Guatemala, one that has uncovered alleged illegal campaign contributions to Morales, as well as allegations of corruption by his, brothers, by his brother and son. Foreign policy also reported that following a March 2018 trip to Guatemala, then U.S. Ambassador to the UN, Nikki Haley, began pushing for the U.S. to end its financial support for CSIG. Yet months earlier, Haley argued in an op-ed, quote, corruption spurs revolutions, enables extremist groups, and fuels civil wars. Combating corruption is not just about good governance, it's about maintaining peace and security. What do you think accounts for this inconsistency from the Trump administration? Congressman, I honestly don't know, but I'm glad you raised it. Um, CCIG, in my view, has been the most successful innovation uh, in anti-corruption policy and law, um, certainly in the 15 years that I've been working on legal and policy issues in the hemisphere. Um, it's also been- Most important in the hemisphere or most important in Guatemala? In the hemisphere, um, certainly in Guatemala. And why? Expand on that. What's so great about CC? CC took a, an extremely fragile judicial system um, with almost absolute impunity for the powerful, um, with high degrees of penetration, uh, co-option, intimidation by organized crime, and turned it into a place where um, not only was that impunity broken, um, Guatemalan, Guatemalan democracy quite literally was saved on a couple of occasions by CSIG. Presidents, vice presidents, ministers started going to jail. Um, and I think most importantly, the courageous Guatemalans who were always there, the attorney generals, Claudia Paz, Tel Maldana, were able to do their work. I think what we discovered when, when you put CSIG in the country and you gave them sort of this blanket of protection, was that Guatemalans are capable, they're courageous, they just need to be in an environment where everything they're doing is not being leaked to organized crime and their families aren't being intimidated and they're not being forced into exile. Uh, and, and so CSIG was a game changer. It was also a, a something that had strong bipartisan support. It was created during the George W. Bush administration. Right. Um, supported through the Obama administration, supported at the beginning of the Trump administration. Secretary Tillerson gave a speech in, in Austin in which he praised the Sikh. So it came as a, a, I would say, not just a surprise, but sort of a devastating blow to those of us who work on this issue um, to see the Trump administration, uh, in some respects, uh, turn its back on CC. And do you think President Morales has felt emboldened by the Trump administration's tepid response to his actions? There's no question in my mind. Um, I, I will say the Trump administration's broader policy in Guatemala in the last couple of months has seemed to find its footing again. Uh, so the, the administration's uh, stance on the revival of an amnesty law for war-related crimes has been, has been good. Um, uh, and, and some of its statements on, on election-related issues uh, have also been good. The, um, the decision to um, on the, the jeeps that were misused uh, to intimidate CSIG and, and other uh, Guatemalan organizations, institutions. Again, uh, I think the, the administration is coming uh, to a better place on some of those broader rule of law issues in, in Guatemala, but certainly on CSIG, um, it was not just um, disappointing, but emboldening, as you said, for uh, Jimmy Morales and his campaign to save his own skin by going after CSIG. All right, well, I have just a little time left. Uh, Ms. Salazar, let me bring you into this. Given this idea about the Guatemalans' own capacity being freed here, what, what, can you, what is your idea about how different countries have prosecuted or not prosecuted corruption cases? Is it differences in legal framework? Is it, does the U.S. have a big role to play or the U.N. in helping empower countries? As I was saying before, I think that, I mean, in general, uh, 
in general, in legal uh, judicial institutions in Latin America are weak. But in particular, if you analyze country by country, there are good people working in good institutions. I mean, it is possible to identify particular areas, divisions worthy to support. Maybe it sounds strange, but for example, this is what happened in Peru. There is a huge corruption scandal, not necessarily the Odebrecht case, but a similar one. And because of this case, the general prosecutor had to resign, but there is still a group within the general prosecutor's office investigates, investigating the Odebrecht case and investigating it very good. I mean, really, they are doing a great job. Um, so uh, for, this is my first idea. And the second, the second idea is that there are, in terms of prosecution for the Odebrecht case, there are differences in, in countries. I would say that uh, the countries that have, mo have done more have been Brazil and Peru, and the countries that have done less are, uh, of course, Venezuela and, and Mexico. Unfortunately, Mexico. Yeah, they have done almost anything. Thank you. Uh, sorry to go over, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Congressman Gonzalez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you to the panel for being here with us today. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm going to continue asking a couple of questions that uh, Congressman Espiat and Congressman Levin talked about, which in particular is with uh, in Guatemala. And I'm very interested in Guatemala because I think the idea of CICIG is a great idea, but there's some issues that concern me. But I think it's a great idea that we have a group that is uh, internal in a country and is on the ground fighting corruption on a daily basis. Um, my concern is, do we ha what Department of Justice supervision do we have on CICI, if at all? That could be to either any, anyone on the panel who wants to take that question. Mr. Hall might know about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know authoritatively. Um, my understanding is that it, it's, it's not a Department of Justice program, so um, it's, it's not supported directly in the way that other um, more bilateral relations. That's my understanding as well. So um, how do we measure the accountability of CICIG? Do, does anybody know how much has been spent on that group in the last 10 years? Congressman, that, that information is, is public, but I don't have yeah. it in front of me. Well, it's about $168 million. That's a lot of money. And uh, I see what the Department of Justice could do with $168 million just in a small, you know, in the Southern District of Texas where I practice law. And they would have a lot of arrests and convictions. And uh, I know they did a great job at the beginning with Otto Perez and, and that organization that was severely corrupt. And, and I'm sure we're far from where we need to be. But my only concern is that uh, I feel the Department of Justice should be more involved in overseeing what's happening in Guatemala and in particular with CICIG, um, at the end of the day, I, I know, and, and by no means am I giving uh, President Morales or the government of Guatemala a pass on anything, but it is concerning that we have an international organization uh, in that group with complete Im immunity, if I'm correct, if I'm not correct, please correct me, right? With complete immunity, um, with high investment, both American and international, and it seems like we, we don't have milestones that we could measure that that investment is a good investment. And, um, uh, and, I, and I just could tell you, to, to, you know, just looking at what we do in the Department of Justice in one area with $168 million, it seems that we would have a massive result uh, from that. And I don't see, I did see some great results at the beginning, but it seemed to kind of have taken a huge dip. Um, and I know that at the end of the day, the president was, uh, uh, the president's brother and son had some issues. Do you know, can you tell me anything about that? Um, I agree with you, Congressman Gonzalez, about the accountability thing. I think all institutions need to be accountable for their work that they do and the money they receive, either state money or private money. This is clear. I don't, I don't know the details about the accountability mechanisms of CC where, but I agree totally with you that they need to be accountable for the way they have spent their money. But on the other side, I have to address uh, the great work that the CC has done. Do, do you know, excuse me for interrupting, do you know why, um, what are the issues that concern 
the president's brother and son, that they got caught up in a corruption scandal in Guatemala. Does anybody here know the details of that? Well, they were, of course, they, did, they didn't like what the CC was doing because in one of But do you know what they're being accused of? Um, I don't remember. Illegal finance. Okay, that's, that's a political, that's the president. Yeah. I'm talking about the son and the brother. I don't remember. I okay. don't remember. I've been, uh, I've done a little bit of research on this, and it, it had to do with $10,000 worth of gift baskets, ah, okay. yeah. which is quite shocking. And I have no problem, you know, anybody who commits a crime should, should pay for it and, and deal with it. But I have a huge issue that I know we barged into that presidential palace with cameras and machine guns to arrest a kid who had been going to school here in the United States that came down to face the consequences. Mm -hmm. And I just think that Sasig, when they did that, really, I think it hurt their credibility. And not, I'm not talking about Guatemala because what other country, I thought that, that was a great model to take to other countries in Central America and Mexico and South America, but how are we ever gonna get them to accept that program when they see that type of abuse in places like Guatemala? I accept that, you know, if this is the case, I would agree with you that maybe it was a mistake in, a, in the strategy to select the case, but, but I wouldn't think that this decision, this maybe bad decision would, you know, nullify or would, you know, uh, disappear all the important things that the CC has done. And I, I, agree, I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. At the beginning, I think they did a great job, but I do feel that something went off track at some point and, um, you know, I think that maybe the UN should have gotten involved at that point and maybe changed the leadership or something to 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 save the integrity of Sasig and to allow that or an organization like that to be acceptable to other Central American countries or Latin American countries. And I'm I'm particularly bothered that the Department of Justice plays a very little very little role in that group. We have if you allowed me to say. Um if that happened, I would agree with you that you need to do more oversight about C6 uh, activities. So who would do that? I would agree with that. But again, on the other hand, we need to preserve the institution. We need to preserve the initiative because, you know, if you see in other countries in the region, they are asking for a C6 because it, in many countries, state institutions are co-opted by, by the political power and the criminal organizations. I agree. But who would supervise CC? Okay. I'm I yield back. <laughs> okay. You can answer that later. I gave you a minute and a half. Congressman Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, to our panel. I I'd like to move to a little bit more macro level and, and discuss for a moment how we measure corruption, how we best measure, cor measure corruption, and how we provide incentives to combat corruption. Uh, so turning to the former, I, I'd welcome each of your thoughts on, on using the Corruption uh, Perceptions Index uh, as, a, as a real measure uh, of corruption and uh, if there are some alternatives that we should be considering. Mm -hmm. Congressman, thank you. So corruption is notoriously hard to, to measure, which is probably why you're asking the question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, asking experts, as the, the CPI, the Corruption Perceptions Index, does is one method. Another is to ask citizens themselves. Right their experience, so you know, have you paid a bribe in the last six months, in the last year? Um, those capture slightly different things. One is more about petty corruption, the other is about grand corruption. I think the, the CPI is probably the best thing we have. I don't think it means that we can take a country that's 67th on the list and say it's doing better than a country that's 68th on the list. You know, it's, it's more, you know, it, it helps us kind of spot general trends and, and place countries um, comparatively in, in, in broader terms, um, but certainly, um, you know, we do have a challenge in terms of accurately measuring corruption. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Elzar. Yeah. Briefly. Yeah, I agree with Michael. It's very difficult to measure corruption. For me, as a lawyer, I'm not a political scientist, but, but uh, as a lawyer, I think that, you know, if you find high-level corruption cases with no prosecution or with high level of, levels of impunity, well, for me in this country, the problem of, of corruption is very high. But I want to... Uh, Two things. Uh, one is that um, the I mean, why Odebrecht happened and these kind of cases happened. Uh, the Odebrecht case, I think it found a very particular context in the region because we went through, the, during the last 20 years, 15 years in Latin America, we went, we went through, a, a, through a crisis of political parties. Our traditional political parties lost 
trust from the from the from the public, uh, and this is why appear many new political parties, small ones, who need money. They need money to 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 do their campaigns, and this is where other rest appeared. So two needs found each other, and I think it was a great context for for other rest to to have a success. And the second thing is that um, for me the main sign that the anti an anti corruption movement or anti corruption measures are having success is seeing that high level authorities are being are prosecuted and are in prison. This is the best example that you can have in any Latin American countries as a deterrent for corruption. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hall? Uh, I've already uh, made clear that I'm an advocate for deterrence, so I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I, I, so I agree with Ms. Saladar's uh, comment. Um, I, I also think uh, perception does matter. I mean, I, I analogize it to um, the orga organized crime in Philadelphia, where I'm mm -hmm. from, and um, the effect of organized, the pernicious effect of organized crime W often was overlooked in press coverage of, of the mob. The, what would get covered would be things exploding, and people getting shot, you know, and exciting events like that. But, but where it really was felt was on the street. You know, if there was somebody, you know, causing a problem in the neighborhood, the neighbors would have to ask themselves, do I call the police or do I call the capo? You know, and, you know, and when, you, you know, the mob infiltrates unions, that affects people's jobs, and it affects, you know, who gets hired for what, and then when, of course, when um, politi American politicians are corrupted by the mob, the same thing happens, and people, it's this exact phenomenon we're describing. People just lose confidence in the, in the process, and they don't believe that they're gonna be treated fairly, and so they have to make these decisions. It becomes a shadow government, in effect. Um, so the idea of asking people you know, questions about how, how does this affect you uh, on a concrete level I agree, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. We have less than a minute left, but I'd welcome any comments uh, on incentivizing uh, good governance and you know, Millennium, uh, Millennium Challenge Corporation, whether or not any of you think uh, those are worthy mechanisms to provide incentives to encourage good government. We have about 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, well, uh, you know, thumbs up for MCC. Mm -hmm. um, certainly anything that, uh, that creates a, a direct link between stronger rule of law, stronger programs to combat corruption, and, um, and stronger support from the United States, I think is a, a good idea. And, and effective? Um, yeah. <laughs> I like succinct answers. <laughs> All right, we're out of time. I yield back, thank you. Thank you. Congressman Castro? Thank you. I wanna ask you all, uh, and I apologize, that I've been running around this morning, so I just got in, but uh, this corruption, how much of it is driven by poverty and socioeconomic circumstances versus by greed, for example, or graft, or things like that? Mm. Well, in the case of petit corruption, I think, you know, poverty and lack of opportunities are, are, are an important factor. But uh, when we talk about grand corruption, big criminal organizations, you know, working as a network to, to, to take advantage of public wealth for their own gain, I don't think it is, I mean, I mean, it is connected to poverty, it is connected with greed and, and taking advantage of the state, of state, state wealth. And also, uh, you all may have gone through this already, but what, do you, what is the, we've talked a lot, for example, about doing something in the Northern Triangle countries of Central America. A big part of that would be an anti-corruption assistance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what is the scale of the challenge, as far as y'all can tell? For example, are we talking about $5 billion? Are you talking about $20 billion, $30 billion? What's the scale of the challenge? Congressman, obviously it's hard to put a number on it. Um, the, sure. the Central America package that was fo focused on the Northern Triangle that I was involved in, and piecing together was the one that the Obama administration designed. It was a billion dollar per year package. I think Congress funded about three quarters of that, which is still a significant uh, investment in the region. Um, and, and so I think something uh, on, on that kind of magnitude is, is probably 
uh, about right. There is obviously an issue of absorption capacity um, as well as the, the vast sort of needs on the ground. Um, but I think just as important as kind of the scale is is this this issue of incentives that Congressman Phillips raised, which is you know how how can we be more more nimble uh, with that money? How can we uh, put it in places where it's being um, used by responsible stewards? Um, we've seen just taking the, the the Northern Triangle countries for example, we've seen extraordinary attorney generals and we've seen corrupt attorney generals. Um, shouldn't our assistance be responding to the particular people in charge of the the institutions on the ground that we're supporting? Uh, in order to uh, both get more bang for, for the U.S. taxpayer's buck, um, but also incentivize proper behavior by our partners in the region. Anybody else? Yeah, just briefly again, for me, the best deterrent for, for, for corruption uh, is putting high-level authorities in prison, really. I mean, this is what I've seen in the region. This is the best example for, for all of us and the best deterrent. All right, are you back, Jerry? Well, I want to take this time to thank the witness, Mr. Hall, Ms. Salazar, Ms. Camilleri, and all the members that, are, that were here today. And with that, the committee is now adjourned. Good job. <laughs> No se vale. <laughs>